In this segment, we're going to talk about operationalizing design decisions via design vectors. A design vector is a set of design variables that specify the aspects of a design choice that are under our control. Now, these designs can take on two different forms. One, where we have control or influence over alternative novel solutions. These are traditional designs. And then we also have choices, where we may have existing or off-the-shelf solutions. In practice, we often have a mixed set of different designs and choices that we need to trade and include together. These can be parameterized via a design vector, and the design vector must then be enumerated, where we list the possible combinations of different designs, and then we need to sample. The proposed designs and choices need to drive the value attributes. We call this value-driven design. This ensures that we're focusing on answering the right question, and not needlessly looking at design trade-offs that may have no impact on the ultimate benefit cost trades. Now, the design vector specifies the space of designs that are going to be considered in this study. It's important to recognize this. The span of variables include all of the aspects of the design that we're going to consider. Every design variable has units and a range that's going to be considered, and possibly sampling levels. Good design variables capture the range of possible solutions. They're realistic, either physically or in terms of available technology or components. They're under the control of the designer, and they impact attributes. An example design vector for the space tug includes three elements. The manipulator mass, which specifies the size of the payload, measured in terms of kilograms and has four discrete levels. This was chosen to drive the capability attribute. The second design variable is propulsion type. This is a categorical variable that included storable biprop, cryogenic biprop, electric, and nuclear thermal. The propulsion type was chosen so it would drive the delta V and the response time attributes. And lastly, the third design variable was amount of fuel on board, which was specified at eight different levels to get across a large range of different possible masses. The amount of fuel was chosen to drive, again, delta V and response time. Supporting the development of design variables, we developed an approach called design value mapping, which is a matrix-based approach to ensure that design variables actually drive the attributes. We start off by taking our attributes previously listed and putting them along the columns of a matrix. These often include our units and range. Next, we put the design variables along the rows. This could be a very large brainstormed list. Each design variable should have associated with them units and range, so we have a good idea about the kinds of designs that we're going to be considering. Next, either individually or in groups, we put a 0, 1, 3, or 9 in the cells at the intersection of each row and column. These represent the degree of impact that a design variable has on an attribute. 0 means no impact, 1 means light impact, 3 means moderate impact, and 9 means strong impact. This is our first order model. Filling out the 0, 1, 3, 9 allows us to understand the degree of impact that a design variable has on the attributes. After we've entered the 0, 1, 3, or 9, we sum across the rows and the columns. Columns whose sums are high means that that attribute is being driven strongly. If there is a low sum down a column, that means that that attribute is only weakly driven and poses a risk that there are some aspects of the value proposition that cannot or may not be met. Looking at row sums, we see the design variables that most strongly impact value and those that only have weak impact. Design variables that have weak impact likely should not be included in a study. The more design variables and acceptable levels for those design variables, the larger the trade space. The bigger the trade space, the more effort required to develop the models and simulations to evaluate them, the longer it might take as well. So there's a tension between having a large enough design space that drives the values and a small enough design space that could be explored and analyzed in the resources allowed for the study. The benefits of a design value mapping process include focusing attention on driving value, identifying preliminary design drivers, and providing documentation and justification for an inclusion and exclusion decisions on factors affecting a trade space study. We've also found that it's incredibly effective as a boundary object for cross-disciplinary conversation. Often in complex systems, you have many domain experts that don't talk to one another, or they locally optimize according to their own domain. By collaboratively filling out a DVM, these domain experts can identify points where there may be mismatch in mental models or where their decisions might negatively affect other decisions. A DVM also motivates creative proposing of new and different design variables, and therefore concepts, and helps to break away from anchoring on prior concepts that may not actually make sense going forward. A precaution of using a DVM includes the fact that it's a poor first order model. It's really only a screening model that should be used for focusing on design variables that most affect the value space. It also does not take into account context dependence and complex interactions among the design variables. These will be taken into account to the extent possible 
in the actual modeling and evaluation phase that happens later. You will be using DVMs in this week's project.